Uh, our last story comes from uh, the good old U.S. of A., the, the state of North Dakota. Um, if you guys haven't been, I think I've only been to Fargo. That's the only city I've been to in North Dakota. No, I've also been, I've, I've passed through Bismarck. In, in 2018, my ex-wife and I did a cross-country tour together, and we, and we drove through Bismarck, and, then we, and we did a show in Fargo. But we did it at the end of the summer, and it was, uh, it was a fucking nightmare. <laughs> It was and, and nothing. Nothing. It's it's not because of Fargo. It's not because of the the comedians that put the show together, uh, or or the people that were actually there to watch the show. It's because uh, we were in a brewery in the middle of uh, festival season, and we had a bunch of fucking people that were on like those brewery tour things, and they could not give two shits less about what we were doing. Uh, so yeah, you know, who doesn't give a shit about, uh, the military industrial complex, uh, people that go on brewery tours and get hammered. They, they really don't give a shit about a comedian trying to take down <laughs> the American empire. <laughs> like they really don't give a shit. <laughs> uh, but this story comes again, this is also from the world Socialist world socialist website. Um, uh, North Dakota, the, the state health official or state health officer, uh, Dirk, Dirk Wilk. That's his name, Dirk Wilk. He already, he already kind of sounds like a like a high school bully, right? Doesn't he sound like he would just throw you, like he, he's like the jock that would definitely fucking throw you in the locker just because, you know, you, you look funny. And he, like, this guy, this guy owns a cabin in like the outskirts of, you know, <laughs> what Bismarck, North Dakota. And uh, he definitely has a cabin specifically for his guns. Dirk Wilk. State Health Officer Dirk Wilk, in tandem with the Republican governor, uh, is forcing nurses who have tested positive for COVID-19 but are asymptomatic to continue treating patients. Now, if the Republican Party could, this is a small, it's a teeny tiny favor I'm asking of the Republican Party, is if they could just get their own head out of their small intestines, because I mean, they got it shoved way the fuck up there. If they, I mean, even if you could just get it out of the small intestine and just kind of be like in the colon area. I think a little bit more logic would be able to get through. And look, it's impressive that they can get their head so far up their own ass, right? That they like start reaching into the digestive tracts, just like a horrible, horrible uh, Ouroboros, like just just like that, uh, like an awful version of a snake eating itself. Uh, but if they could do that, maybe they could see why what they're doing is just the like it's insane. Like asymptomatic nurses treating COVID-19 patients, how is that even gonna get better? <laughs> if your healthcare workers are infected, they should go home and quarantine for two weeks. Especially if they're asymptomatic, that means that they don't need to be on ventilators. They don't need to be in the hospital directly. And they definitely don't need to be in the hospital working with fucking other patients. Like that's crazy, especially patients that already have COVID-19, that's insane. All you're doing is increasing the, the, the rate of spread exponentially. What kind of fatalist bullshit is this where you're just like, well, you already fucking have it. You can't, you can't get it more than you have. You can't get double the COVID. You can't get COVID-38. It's a mad joke that I think only like three people are going to get. So... <laughs> this is, I mean, this is, how is this not like a giant violation of human rights? at this point, right? Like this is an insane violation of human rights. That's really what this boils down to. <laughs> like like, like the, the governor of North Dakota should be brought up on charges of human rights violations. You can't force sick people to work with other sick people. You're gonna get everybody more sick. And, th and, then, what, and then it's like, okay, well, you, we can't have you work with the highly infectious people. Why don't you go work with the other people? 
why don't you go help the, the, the kid with the broken arm? Or the guy that has a flu? No, go, get the, go home. Send them home. Send them home with pay. So that they can heal and they can get better and then they can come back and like, you know, fucking help people that need to be helped. So this is this is the other kind of infuriating part. Let me see if I can make this work here. Um, this is the other infuriating part. Is the uh, the union in North Dakota made this really kind of disappointing, half-hearted statement. Here we go. Here's their statement. The union statement reads, the North Dakota Nurses Association does not support the practice of allowing nurses who are asymptomatic COVID-19 positive to care for patients as a long-term solution to mitigate staffing shortages. <clears throat> we recognize that this action was recently taken as a crisis standard of care in order to continue providing patient care. Now, uh, the World Socialist website uh, calls this the toothless announcement merely suggests that the state uh, should attempt to return to a non-crisis standard of care as soon as possible, while COVID-19 positive nurses who are well enough can decide for themselves if they will provide care for their patients. Ah, yes, of course. Let's, uh, let's go to that free will argument. It's really what it boils down to, right? This is that free will argument. Oh, man. You got free will to do what you please. Look, we do have free will to do what we please, but it boils down to this, right? If if these nurses decide that they don't want to um, be in a hospital taking care of patients because they are asymptomatic and positive with COVID-19 and they go home and quarantine for two to three weeks, are they going to be penalized at their job? Which would be also stupid because you have a, you, I mean, you have shortage of staff, like you have a staffing shortage. So you're going to penalize staff that decided to be safe and then continue to have a staffing shortage. Like, like make the staffing shortage worse because somebody tried to like make it safe. Um, are, are they going to get two weeks with pay? Unlikely, uh, my guess is unlikely. Um, so, it, you know, again, now we're, we're talking about the same thing. We're talking about economy versus safety, economy versus public health. And a lot of people are going to choose the economy. And again, this is the exact same thing that led to a massive spike in March and April in the United States because we didn't lock down fast enough. And people that were getting COVID-19 that were contracting this thing were still going to work. And then they were they were infecting their coworkers. They were infecting other people if they worked with the public because we have a system that doesn't allow for people to take breaks. Because if you take breaks, you can't get paid. And if you can't get paid, you can't eat your food. So you have to be in this constant, constant cycle of constantly working no matter what, even in a voracious pandemic. Honestly, like what's happening in North Dakota is grounds for a healthcare strike. And and back in March, way back in March, I said this thing will 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 really get serious when the healthcare industry decides that they want to go on strike because the government has not provided them with PPE. You have people like, you know, Dirk Wilk and and the Republican governor of North Dakota saying that these nurses have to work even if they're infected. Right, continuing to create a, a bigger spike, a bigger problem. That all becomes, it, it, the pressure of that will become overwhelming and then it'll burst into a, a healthcare strike. And I understand why the nurses and doctors don't want to do that right now because there is a staffing shortage and they don't really care about the, well, most of them don't really care about the staffing thing. I, I genuinely believe that most of these not, dirt nurses and doctors want to help people. They want to make sure that this pandemic doesn't get 
even worse than it already has. And so they won't go on strike because, you know, and, and maybe because their, their union isn't really talking to them about how to appropriately do it because there is a way to do it. You know, when there was a massive general strike uh, in various different cities, in various different points in the early 1900s, um, they, the community came together and, and helped each other out. Like Seattle, for example. In Seattle, 1919, the, the strike leaders, the union leaders, organized. Uh, they set up like food shelters in various different uh, parts of uh, uh, the, the city. They were delivering milk. They were delivering oil to hospitals. Uh, healthcare workers were taking care of the sick whenever they need. So it, 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 you, you can still do those things. It's just, you know, it's just not under some kind of established institution anymore. It becomes more communal rather than institutional. And there is ways to do that. But I understand why, why these doctors and nurses don't want to take the risk of doing something like that. There'd have to be a really big organization behind it. And by organization, I mean like organizing through, you know, the labor movement. But these state officials are essentially just exponentially making the spread of this disease worse. The big picture here is that, that capitalism on a global scale has, has not just failed the people, but is failing the planet at this point. And there's zero foresight. There's absolutely zero foresight. Again, in July, we knew that this, there was going to be a spike in October. Um, there was a bunch of people talking about it. I know I mentioned it a few times that there's going to be another spike in October. It's part of the reason why, like, I, I mean, by the time, by the time July rolled around, I really knew that I wasn't going to be back on the road until like sometime next year. And now that I'm, now that I'm in this space, I'm going to say that I don't think I'm going to be back on the road really full time doing it the way that I was doing it until next fall. So maybe next September, October, somewhere around there, which really sucks, um, you know, because I love being on the road and, and, and I'm in my 30s now. So it's like, all right, you know, my body's not going to be able to fully be on the road 40 to 50 weeks out of the year. That's going to that's that's a lot. But still, you know, so. Um, it's. It's not going away and politicians like this are perpetuating it and making it a lot worse. We could have been in preparation for this since July. In June, the CARES Act came out, the, the second version of it, and Nancy Pelosi was arguing for more corporate health care initiatives. Then how do we take care of the people? Um, in June, Pramila Jayapal got chastised by the entire Democratic Party, including including the Progressive Caucus, which was her caucus, for talking about universal basic income. Had there been a universal basic income put into place, um, and had we taken this thing seriously to say, well, the WHO and a lot of scientists are saying that this thing is going to have a resurgence in, in the fall, in October, um, specifically, I think by October, November is what they were calling. Let's figure out what we're going to do in terms of hospitals, in terms of healthcare, and in terms of schooling, because those are the three big things that happened during the fall season. And maybe you wouldn't have had to go into a major lockdown measure if that was what you were talking about, but it was all short term, right? It's like, how do we celebrate Labor Day? How do we celebrate Thanksgiving? How do we celebrate Christmas? And it's like, who... No, none of that stuff is really particularly important right now. Holidays, how about let's get through this pandemic and then we'll think about how to fucking perpetuate more consumerism through uh, religious religious means, whatever whatever you whatever you need th that to be, right? Like we can think about that later. You can have your little quarantine and spend it together with your quarantine. I don't think it's going to be a, a year where you get to travel state across state lines and go see your fucking family. Because the politicians that, that are in charge of this country, the, including the Democrats who people you know put up on this high of moral superiority, did fucking nothing to stop this from happening. 
even though they knew. Again, they knew about it. And they and and now you have people like Dirk Wilk and the governor of fucking North Dakota making sick nurses take care of people with COVID-19. That's what capitalism does. And it is a system that has zero foresight. It's about how do I make the most amount of money now? Who gives a shit about later? And look at look at wh where that's gotten us. So I, I'm I'm still astounded as to how many people still validate this system and want to participate in it. We're never going to get out of this system. We're never going to find anything different and new if we don't break away from it. You can't reform something that has no interest in being reformed. Which is why Joe Biden is, is kind of the perfect shiny example for um, the Democrats' version of, of uh, the leader of capitalism, right? Like that's because he's he doesn't want to be reformed. He's just an old man that's set in his ways and he just wants you to love him for who he is. You know? I don't think capitalism is the answer to this thing. And I think once we realize that, we might be able to uh, to shift away from it. And fingers crossed, I hope we do. Uh, you know, I hope I hope on the ground floor as as people we do and, and we start looking at things like mutual aid um, and general strikes and and under, trying to understand what the labor movement did. By the way, I have a ton of videos about that on this channel. So, uh, yeah. Cool. I'm going to take a look at your comments and we are going to wrap this thing up. Uh, do, 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 do. Yeah, it becomes it becomes more about um, more about money than than the people. That's exactly what it what it boils down to. Um, another example of the bourgeoisie expo exploiting the proletariat. They, yeah, that's that's really all they care about is they were like, who gives a shit? Profit over people. Yep. Um, that's the thing about the healthcare strike. I was talking to a nurse friend. I was a dialysis patient. If one of our techs or nurses went on strike, who would take care of those who need treatment or die? Yeah, that's that's part of the reason why they don't, and that's that's what the plans would have to come up with. So, um, you know, in, in Minneapolis too, in 1934, there was a massive general strike, um, and <clears throat> basically, the farmers decided that we should feed the strikers. So, so they did. Uh, they, they fed the strikers, uh, they brought over their, their, their food and, uh, you know, a lot of the stuff was like extra stuff. So there, there is a plan that could be put into place of, of how to do this, right? You could, you could work in shifts to get in and out of the hospitals, but realistically what would happen and, or, or what they would have to plan for would be, uh, the, the oligarchs, you know, the mayors of the cities or the governors of the states or even up to the president that would look at something like a healthcare strike um, and then hire police officers to guard the hospitals from from them getting in to just see their patients to do what they what, what is the right thing to do uh, because they're on strike. And even though they're not getting paid for it, they can still help out. And, you know, then the rest of the community comes and feeds the nurses and brings them, you know, a change of clothes, uh, some tea or whatever it might be. There could be some organization around that. It would take some effort and it would take some coordination. And I know there are some groups out there that are doing that sort of stuff. Uh, like w one of the big groups, uh, I believe it's called Cord uh, Cooperation Jackson. Um, they were part of the May Day uh, actions and strikes that happened there. So, you know, you could look at some of these bigger groups and try to coordinate something. It be it would be very, very difficult, especially when it comes to a healthcare strike. But I do think that if there was one, uh, that is going to be the spark um, for a much bigger kind of movement that would really scare the oligarchs in power. Because uh, I think I think if they if they see like the healthcare workers are striking, then Holy shit. <laughs> you know, this is something serious. Um, yes. Uh, Nancy, Nancy Pelosi was worrying about Cobra over anything else. And she made a case for how uh, Cobra would, would be the be all end all. And it would be the, the savior of, of healthcare. Um, Dems knew and didn't fight for anything for the working class. Yes. Th yeah. That's what they, that's kind of what they do. Um, 
Yeah, I started looking into it a whole lot. I, I do know the a lot of the <laughs> history of strikes and the, the labor movement and stuff. It's something that I've been interested in for a long time, and uh, I really started doing like a lot of a lot of deep digging and deep diving uh, of of the labor movement uh, over over the last over the over the last year year and a half or so. So, yeah, which is cool. It, it's it's important history to know, I think. Uh, and this, I'm gonna. This will gonna be the last comment I look at, and then we're gonna wrap this video up. Um, they will never solve the problem because if they did, we would stop looking to them to help. That's how they stay in power. Yeah, it, that is that is a very good point, Virgil, and that is exactly why they won't. It's it's not really about fixing the problems. It's about how to alleviate the problem for a little bit, and then let it grow. So they can come back and alleviate a little bit and come back and alleviate. It's, it's like how the pharmaceutical industry handles it. The pharmaceutical industry literally said that they're not interested in curing any diseases because then they would lose their profit margins. So they just want to make it tolerable. And that's essentially what they do. It's like, how do we make things tolerable so that they don't strike and they don't, you know, rise up and take action and things of that sort. But, you know, uh, they are committing large human rights violations, and I don't think history uh, will. They, they're they're going to be on the right side of history, and I don't think that they will come out being the the good guys uh, in all of this. Hey, what's up, everybody? Thank you guys so much for checking out this video. If you enjoyed the content in this video, make sure you like, subscribe, and share. My content is highly suppressed because this is not topics of conversation that uh, that the corporate mainstream media really wants to 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 address here. So make sure you like, share, and subscribe. Uh, sign up for my email list. Uh, uh, that way you'll get weekly uh, emails with all of the podcasts and all of the videos that I put out there. Um, and make sure you go to my website and follow me there, uh, krishmohanhaha.com. That's going to be your one-stop shop for all things Krish Mohan. That's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. See you in the next video.